to you know get off on tangents enough that this training is pushing the the, the time limit anyway so we're going to start by talking about uh, first of all, we actually need to turn on these intermediate level of the tools. So I'm going to go ahead and edit this page and I'm going to go ahead and open up design tools. And then all of the tools that we're going to talk about in the training today are found under the design tools settings up here in the top right. So I'm going to set this to automatically launch the tools, but then we have all of these additional things that we can turn on. Now you could manually turn on, turn them on one at a time, or we have these comfort levels. Now, um, one other thing to note about these different tools is that this is a user level setting. This is something that only is going to apply to you. You're not setting it for your whole institution when you choose these. However, if you use one of these tools to create content, for example, this page has a progress bar that we're going to talk about here in a little while. But you'll notice here we have the add advanced elements with that progress bar. So if we were to come down and turn on the progress bar, uh, we would always see it. If we haven't turned it on, you know, but it was used in creating the content, it's gonna show up here. Just that's something that I often forget till the very end. So we're gonna try telling you that here at the first. All right, so in the customize the style section, this is where Michelle showed in the first training how to work with images, links, tables, and lists. Here in this training, if we go ahead and turn on that intermediate level of the tools, you'll see that we've now gained the ability to work with colors and spacing and borders and you know a bunch of other pieces here. And now our add advanced elements in addition to that progress bar that was used on this page has things like accordions and you know teacher and TA information and a bunch of other things that we're gonna go over uh, a little later on. And so we've got that set. I'm gonna go ahead and close our settings and we're just gonna kind of start at the top here and work our way down. Now, one of the first things that you gain here in the intermediate level that we're gonna take a look at is the ability to play with color. I am a huge fan of playing with color, thoroughly enjoy it. And so with the tools here at the intermediate level, you can start to do some fun things with colors. Now, uh, the actual theme colors for your institution were customized before the install and maybe even customized afterwards by the institution to kind of match that institutional branding. But um, here, we can play with this because, you know, if, if you are, are fortunate enough to work with an institution who lets you play, uh, here at the top, there's this colors for banner theme area. And each of the rows here represents a different portion of that stylized heading. And you can kind of hover over it to get an idea of what you're going to be changing. But we can adjust background color, we can adjust text color, and then this column over here is going to let us know if there's sufficient contrast, if it meets that WCAG 2.0 rating. Uh, for the difference between your text and your background color. So you'll see here, we've got a double A for normal text and a triple A for large text. If I go ahead and open up this color picker, you'll see a couple of different things. Here on the left, we have some color swatches. These can be set up at the institution level, or we can pick some colors, you know, just using these different uh, options over here on this side. But if you watch that WCAG rating, right now we're at AA, and as long as you're green, you're meeting that accessibility guideline. If you have that AA or AAA. If I go a little bit darker, we will hit a point where now we've got that um, AAA for both of those. Now, if you keep an eye on that rating, although it kind of scrolled out of the way here just a bit, let me do that again. No matter where I select in here, you'll notice that we are getting a AA or AAA uh, color contrast rating. If you watch what happens in the rich content editor, as I go lighter in color or darker in color, it's going to determine whether black text or white text is going to give you the best contrast and it'll automatically set that for you. So as long as you're only really worrying about changing the background colors, if you let design tools pick the text color, it's very difficult to actually find colors that don't meet that accessibility guideline. However, if we come over and we start to try and manually play with that text color, you'll notice it becomes a lot easier to find colors that are going to fail uh, that rating. So let's go ahead and set that. All right, so that's some fun that we can do with uh, there with the, the stylized heading. You'll notice that uh, as I change a color, if there are other areas that are impacted by that, that color will, you know, show up appropriate in whatever row of that table of that those controls any questions about changing uh, the colors for the stylized heading area okay 
If not, let's go ahead and talk about some of the other tools that are available here. Now, really, you have the ability to work with the colors of just about anything. You know, we have all these different tools. Now, the tools in this current element style really are based on where your cursor is, and they are also going to be used depending on what it is you want to accomplish. So just to kind of illustrate some of the functionality, we're going to create something like this little important tip box. And to do that, we're going to use the colors tool, the spacing tool, and the borders tool. Now, I can come over here on the side, and I can open up these panels so that I can see all of those and kind of scroll for them. Uh, my personal uh, opinion, I find I use these in, in connection with a lot of other tools. So up here in the top right, there's a little button that if you click that, it is going to pop those out of that sidebar so that you can drag them around on your screen, put them wherever you might need them to get access to them so that you can have them out while you're working with additional pieces. All right. Now you'll notice that at the top of each of these controls, there's this little apply to section. And so we can see what we're looking at. So I'm going to go ahead and put my cursor here in this heading. And you'll notice that that apply to is actually looking at that heading. Uh, so let's go ahead and change the color here. I'm going to choose a background color and we'll choose this, you know, whatever this, you know, you want to call this blue green, you know, I'm sure it's got some official name, but I don't know what it is color. And we're going to go ahead and set that there. Now, if we were to leave this here, this would drive me insane because it's squished. The eye is right next to the edge here. It's not got a lot of breathing room above it or below it. And so we want to adjust the spacing. So to do that, we'll use the spacing tool. Now with spacing, you can adjust padding and you can adjust margins. We can adjust all directions at once or we could pick just a specific direction. Now, if you're not familiar with the differences between padding and margins, it's easy to illustrate. Let's say we want to give this a hundred pixels of margin. If you look here, we've now got plenty of room around this element, but the content's still squished. So we don't want to use margins. Instead, let's try out padding. So if we set 10 pixels of padding, now we've got a little bit more breathing room going on. So margins take place between the borders of an element and any other element. And paddings take, padding takes place between the borders of an element and its contents. And so we've got that set. I'm going to go ahead and set this on the second, uh, on the second part of this paragraph as well. And in fact, I think where this is in this light gray section, I'm going to come in here uh, and give that a nice white background so it sticks out a little bit more. Okay, so we're getting a little closer. Let's talk about the border. So with my cursor here in this paragraph, I can go ahead and set a border. Now using the borders tool, we can set all directions at once, or we could pick just a specific direction. So I'm going to come in here and I'm going to give this two pixel solid border, and we're going to go ahead and choose that same uh, bluish green color. Okay, getting closer, but now we've got this weird space between these. Now, if you recall, spacing between elements uh, is margins. And if we take a look up here in the margins for this paragraph, you'll notice that it has a default top and a default bottom margin. So if I want these to be together, I need to get rid of that. So I'm gonna put zero in for the top margin, but that didn't really change anything. If we take a look at this heading, you'll notice that it also has a default bottom margin. So I need to zero that one out as well. Now we've got those together, uh, but there does appear to be a line between these. If we change over to the browser preview, uh, sometimes that line might just be the outline around like the paragraph. Um, but it's still there. If we take a look over here at our borders tool, you'll notice that when we're looking at the heading, it has a default bottom border. So I could come in here and say that I want that to, you know, I want that bottom border to be none. And now we've got that set up. If you really wanted this centered, we could go ahead and center it. If you wanted it bolded, you could go ahead and bold it as well, uh, just using the other tools in Canvas. Okay, so hopefully that gives you an idea of how really these different tools are just going to be used depending on what it is you're trying to accomplish. Any questions so far about working with colors, spacing, or borders? All right, we're gonna go ahead and close up the Oh, I guess one other thing I could point out, the little book icon here in the top corners will actually take you to the user guide for that particular tool so that you can read up on how to use it uh, if you have any questions. All right, so we're gonna talk a little bit more about color because there's a couple of things to be aware of. You'll notice here in the controls, there are, there's this light and dark circle. Now what these are going to do is they allow you to kind of gradually change the hue of your color. So if I were to select this heading, and I wanted the color to be a little bit darker. Every time I click this dark circle, 
that color is just going to get gradually darker. Or if I clicked the white one, it would get gradually lighter. So that's just something to be aware of. Now, there may also come times when you want to change something that's not just the current element. So if we look at this table right here, and I want to change the background for this table, rather than going through and changing the color for each one of the cells, what I can do is I can use this apply to to choose a higher level element. So this is the, the header cell. If I look at this, this is going to be the row. And so if I go ahead and select that, I can now come in and I can pick a color that I want to use as the background for that. And it's going to go ahead and set that for me. However, if you're setting a higher level element or an element with other elements inside of it, you need to pay attention to how that styling impacts other things. So let's illustrate that here. I've got this paragraph. If I come in here and I give it a nice blue background here, you'll notice that I've got a double A rating for normal text, a triple A for large text. It looks just fine. If I come to the second paragraph and I give it that same blue color, I still see that I have a double A and a triple A rating here. However, we can no longer read that link because its text doesn't have sufficient contrast. If I place my cursor in that link, this is actually going to let me know that that is failing. And so maybe I want to come in here and I want to change that to like a white you know, text color or something. So just be aware when you're changing uh, a higher level element that you pay attention to how that impacts other things. Okay, any questions about any of that? If not, we'll go ahead and take a look at the next one here. So up next, we're going to talk about these uh, different block and text highlights that we can add. Now, if we take a look here, we've got some that are based off of the Canvas style guide. We've got some that were created specifically for design tools, and we've got some that are based off of the Bootstrap for uh, CSS framework. And with block alerts, what you're really looking at is things like paragraphs, list items, you know, or unordered lists, divs, something that takes up a large chunk of space. So I'm going to go ahead and select this paragraph, and I'm going to—I've popped open that block alerts tool. And I'm just going to go ahead and choose one of these styles. Now, when I've selected that, it's applied it to that paragraph. If I want to remove that, I can. If I want to come in here and choose a different style, I can do that as well. And so you can go through and find the style that you want. Um, to return it back to normal text, just click that remove uh, alert style. Now, one other thing that I've run into as I've create, wanted to create these type of callouts is when you're working with existing content, you may have a bunch of items here that you want to put inside of one of these little callout alerts. So what you can do is we can highlight that using our cursor, and then down at the bottom of this block alerts highlights, there is this wrap selection in a block alert button. If I go ahead and click that, it's going to go ahead and put a div around what I had highlighted and uh, apply that one of those alert styles to it. Now, uh, if I want to change that style, you'll notice if I hover over this apply to, I'm not looking at that current element. You can also tell because we don't have the remove alert. So if I want to change that, just come put your cursor back inside that existing alert, find the level up here in the apply to where that alert applies, and you'll know you've got the right one when you can see that remove alert style. And now I could go through and I can choose uh, whatever style I want to apply to that, okay? Now, another thing to be aware of, this is kind of this, pretty much the same process as uh, Michelle covered in the, the part one training when you're um, turning uh, selection into a content block you often will end up with orphaned pieces beneath it. Uh, we showed you there in that add content blocks, there is that remove empty button that clears everything out of that's empty in your content. Uh, we'll show you another way you can do this in the future, but you'll wanna make sure that you clear out any of those little remaining pieces that might be sticking out. Okay, any questions about block alerts? All right, then let's go ahead and talk about text emphasis and highlights. Now, once again, you can see we have some that come from the Canvas style guide. We've got some that were created specific to design tools, and we've got some highlights and badge styles based off of uh, Bootstrap uh, 4. Now, the, the purpose of these is to actually draw focus or, or give emphasis to a particular word or phrase. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna highlight with our cursor uh, the word or phrase to which we want to draw focus, and then we can go ahead and choose one of those alert styles. Now, uh, this is very similar to that wrapping in an alert in that this has put our cursor outside of it. So if I want to change the style, 
I can put my cursor inside it if I want to come try something different. Okay, so this is actually wrapping that text in an emphasis tag. This is the same thing you get when you italicize something. And we do this so that it will actually um, indicate for a screen reader that you are drawing focus to that text and not just uh, for those who can see it. Now, that being said, uh, we also just recently convinced, one of our accessibility guy here at Utah State, uh, convinced Canvas to add the mark um, tag into you know one of the accepted tags in Canvas that, that we may change over to because that's kind of geared more towards identifying that you've highlighted something. All right. So let's say that I have one of these styles that I like. Let's say I really like this bootstrap badge style, but I'm not particularly fond of any of the colors that are available. What you can do is using the colors tool, if we come over here, we can choose the background color and I could come select whatever color I want and then have my own custom badge color that I can, can use. Now you would have to set that color for any badge that you create, but it does give you that flexibility to add, you know, change your highlights and you know, kind of work with whatever colors you want to work with. Okay. Uh, once again, if you want to remove these, just go ahead and click that remove focus. This would also work for things that were already italicized. So if this were italicized just to normal in the text, uh, you could come in here and apply a style to that as well. Okay. Questions on this one? All right. If not, let's talk about one of my new favorite tools. This is one that uh, uh, came out as part of the September release of Design Tools. Um, now, when Michelle gave the first training and you were working with images, you know, she showed you how you can add these different border styles uh, and apply those to the image. Now, one day I was wanting to add a bunch of new styles to this and I realized that this list of uh, border styles would get really long without even touching the surface of some of the things that I wanted to be able to create. And so the box styles tool, if we go ahead and open this up, you can see you've got a preview here because frankly it annoys me when you've selected an image in Canvas and you can't really see what you're doing to that image because of the outlines that are around it. But what we can do with this tool is we can come make some adjustments. Let's say I want to give this image 10 pixels of padding and I wanna go ahead and add a border to it so I can adjust the width of that border that I want to apply. Maybe we'll come up with a nice picture frame look here. We can change the, the background color um, and we can change the border color. I'm gonna hold off on those for a minute because they actually use the, the new color picker that we've developed that's kind of in beta and we're gonna talk about that one here in just a moment. So for right now, we're just gonna stick with the default white um, and um, just kind of this gray border color. But we can also come in here and we can apply a border radius. So this is rounding the edges. This is something that Canvas strips out when you try and add in manually. But we can come in and choose from some different rounded edges there that we want to apply. Um, actually, I'm going to leave mine square just for fun. And then we can also set some shadows. So we've created, you know, shadows are another thing that Canvas strips out. So we've created some predefined uh, drop shadows that you can go ahead and add to your content. And so we've got this nice style here. Now you don't want to have to repeat that process every time you want to customize uh, one of these images. So what we can do is once we've got one of these set, we can go ahead and click this save style. Now this is just popping up a JavaScript alert for me and I'm just gonna call this, uh, you know, gray border uh, B6 shadow. And I'm gonna go ahead and click okay. And now I have this saved styles drop down up here. So I can come select another image in my content and I could choose that gray border and it's now applied to that. So you can kind of have some fun and customize your own different border styles and apply that. The other fun thing that we can do with this is that this doesn't just work with images. So let's say you've got some sort of quote or something in your content and I wanna come apply that to that quote. I can go ahead and set that. We could also, maybe I want this to float to the right. Uh, and let's say we want it to be like 250 pixels. And you know, I want to make any other adjustments now. Um, actually, I'm gonna go ahead and open this. So this is the, the new color picker. Uh, it's got a lot more going on with it that we'll talk about here in just a moment. But I'm gonna go ahead and choose uh, a white background so that that sticks out a little bit more. And then I'm gonna go ahead and save this as a right gray box, sure. All right, 
And so we can go ahead and have some fun there. One of the other things that we can do is let's say, you know, I'm starting to get a lot of styles in here and the names aren't quite working. You know, it's, I'm not having tell, being able to tell them apart quite as easily as I was hoping. If we click this little edit list pencil, uh, we could come in here and we could rename these. You can also click the pencil next to one of these styles and you can see what is saved. So when you save one of these styles, it's gonna save any CSS classes and it's gonna save any inline CSS. And I could come in here and I could change this. So let's say for example, I want the border uh, to be, you know, black. And I could come save these changes. Now, that's not instantly going to affect any of the, that's not going to affect any of the other things that that was already applied to. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and come in here and I could choose that style again. In all honesty, I don't remember which one of these I edited. That one. Okay, so why didn't it save it? Okay, so apparently, Oh, I, I need to set the border color to black, not just the border. All right, so now let's go ahead and select that. And now we've got a black border. Anyway, so just some fun things that you can do there uh, to, to go ahead and customize and create your own custom callouts and, and alerts, okay? <coughs> Excuse me. Any questions about the box styles tool? Okay. If not, we will go ahead and move on to the next one here. Now, uh, one of the things, you know, I, I told you I love playing with colors. So one of the things that you can actually do with design tools is you can customize your color palette. Now, uh, there's kind of two different ways that this works, depending on whether you are using the current color picker or the new beta color picker. So I'm gonna go ahead and show you the current one first. If I open up this customized color palette, you can see the different colors that are set there. Now, the way that the current tool works, when you first open up design tools, it's gonna to go to the institution level, grab whatever color palettes are set to be the default, and it's gonna build out a color palette for you. From that time on, the color palette is your own, and you can come in here, you could remove color rows, you could add you know, hexadecimal color values if you know them. We can pull some colors from an image, which I'll show you with the new tool here in just a second. Tool works the same. Um, but you have some abilities there to customize it. But if you ever needed to go back and gain the additional institution level ones, you'd need to come reset that to default, okay? So there are some other things that drive me crazy about the current color picker. Um, one is that it's not keyboard accessible. The other is, I can't tell you how many times I've seen people try and close this by clicking the little gray X in the top right corner because that's what user interfaces have trained us to do when in actuality this doesn't close the box, it clears out whatever colors you have set uh, on that element, which is not very fun. Okay, so the new color picker, you can actually try it out and I would actually love it if you would try this out and give me feedback uh, so that, you know, it'll probably go live either in the, um, probably the November release if I, you know, I'm confident in how it's cooperating. But down at the very bottom of the design tool settings, there is the colors to beta that you can go ahead and turn on. And if you turn this on, um, it is going to, oh, I forget. I left that tool open and I need to make it so that it closes when it disappears. Um, all right, we're gonna close that and then we're gonna you know, hide that to customize the color area. Okay, so now in the current element style, we have, this colors beta tool. Now, um, once again, you can open it off on the side or we can pop it out. I am a huge fan of popping it out. So this has a lot more going on to it, um, but there are some things that we can talk about on how this is set up. Right up here at the top, you can choose what color you want to change. And you can also see if there are any default colors set. So right now this has a blue background, but we can see that the text colors and the, you know, are white. There is a bottom color set for the border. Um, if I go ahead and choose this uh, image that we had selected, you can see that it has a white background, but um, you've got some colors for the borders, et cetera. So we can go ahead and use that uh, to choose what we want to change. Then down here, we have some options for picking a color. If you know the hexadecimal color value you want to use, you can type it in here, 
or if you're wanting to use an actual kind of color picker, we can go ahead and drag in here uh, and pick the color that we want. The other thing that we can do in this new tool is if this is a color we think we're gonna be using quite often, we can favorite that color. And so up here at the top, we now have a favorite section where I can go through and I can pick some different colors and I can go ahead and create a list of favorite colors that are gonna follow me around as I work in Canvas. Now, if you wanna get rid of those, you can click that X to get rid of them. Um, the other thing you can do is we can save these as a custom color group. So I'm gonna go ahead and click that. Um, we also have the lighten and darken options. And then over here, there are two options to clear colors. Uh, the X will actually just clear whatever the current color is. So we've got a background color here. If I click that, it's gonna remove the background color. The little eraser will actually clear out any overridden colors, whether that's borders or text or background. Um, it'll clear out all of those. This bottom section here is where you can control the color palettes that are visible. This first one is the colors from your content. Now, hopefully you won't ever be working with pages that use this many different colors. If you do, I would strongly encourage you to rethink your design and simplify your color palette. This one's got all of these because this page has all the example alerts and call outs and things like that. But this will dynamically build out when you're editing content with the colors being currently used in the content. I'm gonna go ahead and turn that off just because it's a little busy right now. Uh, the next section here that we can see are our custom colors. Now you have the ability to go ahead and you know, create those using favorites. The other thing that we can do is we can use this tool which will actually pull up, this is the same tool as the pulling colors from image in the old uh, color picker. But this allows me to browse my computer for an image. Maybe it's the one that you're using as your banner image. And this is gonna pull the top 20 some odd colors that take place in this image. And I can come through here and start to build out a color palette that I want to use for my course. And I can do that using these uh, existing colors. These are the colors that occur most often. Or there's a little box up here in the top right and you can actually use your cursor and come pull colors directly from the image. Uh, if you want to remove a color, just go ahead and uncheck the box next to it. Um, I also am rather nitpicky about things, so um, you can drag and drop and we can go ahead and rearrange our color palette so that it's in a nice, lovely logical sequence for us. Um, you'll also notice as I hover over these, it's gonna change the background color so I can see it in connection with the other colors. It's also gonna update this WCAG table. That's going to let me know if I were to use this as a background color or text on a white background, what kind of accessibility uh, I can expect to get out of that. When I've got that set the way I want it, can't quite decide where I want that one, I can go ahead and add those to the color palette. And if I close this, now I have this custom group. We can also come in here and we can use this edit color swatches. And let's say this original group is for like my English uh, 1010 course. And this new one is for, you know, my math, 1050 or whatever the case may be. You can label those colors. If I decide I wanna change my mind and rearrange things, or I can come in and type a new color or you know, change its color to something different, or I can remove that color. I can also add additional labels or additional colors. And then we can go ahead uh, and save this. And now we've got those customized colors with some names that make a little more sense. You also have the ability in here uh, to view in, uh, your institutional colors. So those that are set up uh, at the institution level, you can even label them. So you may have some official colors and some uh, accent colors that you want to use. There is the basic colors that uh, were you know, kind of by default here in the, the old color picker um, that you can turn on or off. And then the other one that I really liked as I was building this one out is this expanded colors, which gives you some browns and some oranges, some lighter color options and just some different options there that you can choose from. Uh, and then down at the bottom, you still have that ability to see your WCAG rating for whatever your current element is. And then you can also come in here and toggle between black and white text if you have a preference one way, but you wanna see which one meets, has a better accessibility. Or if the one that's, it'll automatically choose the best accessibility, but if you wanted to choose the opposite to see if it passed, you can do that as well. Okay, any questions about the color pickers? either the current one or the beta one. 
Uh, once again, I would ask if you're brave and like to play with color, please turn on that beta one and uh, you know, I'm open to any feedback. There's a lot going on in it. Um, I've tried to simplify it down as much as I can, but any input would be greatly appreciated. All right. If not, we're gonna go ahead and move on to the next tool here. So I'm gonna go ahead and close this. We've covered all of the current element style tools that are here at the intermediate level. Let's start taking a look at some of the advanced elements that we have available for us. Uh, I'm not really gonna go through this list because we're gonna go through these one at a time. We're gonna start by talking about panel widgets. So these are, we have three types. We have accordions, expanders, and tabs. Now tabs are your basic. We've got one panel of content always visible and you go ahead and change it by clicking on the little you know, horizontal tab list. Accordions are vertically stacked, and when you open one panel, it will collapse any other panels, and you can go ahead and go through those. Expanders are a variation of an accordion where you can still ex click on them to expand them, but you can actually have as many panels open as you want, and the panels just kind of operate independently. You also have the ability with the controls above it to collapse the group or expand the whole group. Okay, default behavior is that expanders and accordions begin with everything collapsed and tabs begin with the first panel open. As we take a look at creating these, I'll show you how you can change that default behavior. So we're gonna go ahead and come into our uh, design tools sidebar and come into our add advanced elements and open up the accordions and tabs tool. And you'll notice we have two options. We can create these as their own content block, which would add a new content block at the bottom of the page that we could use the rearrange content to drag and drop and move that wherever we need it to go. The next one that we have is, let's say you have an existing content block that you want to add an accordion into. We can go ahead, put our cursor where we want the accordion to go, and we can choose to add this at the cursor position. And it's gonna go ahead and put in that first uh, panel for us. Now, by default, this isn't a an accordion expander or tab, we need to tell it what we want it to be. So up here in the controls in the right sidebar, we can choose whether we want it to be an accordion, whether we want it to be an expander, or whether we want it to be tabs. And you'll notice when you're in the blocks view, you have a little label that shows up in the top. There's also some dotted outlines and solid outlines to help you tell, you know, make sure that the styling is there for the, the heading and the content and that proper structure is there. Um, typically, you're probably not gonna use these as just a single panel. So you can use this add panel button uh, once your cursor is in an existing accordion expander or tab. And we can go ahead and click that to add in additional panels. When it comes to customizing the text here, particularly with tabs, sometimes if you were to highlight it and hit delete and then start typing, the rich content editor actually got rid of the element that needed to be there. And so it's not gonna work when we save it. Uh, to kind of simplify this in, in some ways, we can come over here and in the controls in the sidebar, these are actual text inputs. So I could go ahead and I could type in, you know, and adjust the heading text right over here and have that reflected in the rich content editor so I'm not having to play the games. This interface is also something that you should start to be familiar with within design tools. We can come in here and we can drag and drop and rearrange the different panels over here. If we wanted to remove one, we could click the red X to go ahead and remove it. The other option we have here is the little check boxes. And if I go ahead and click that, that is going to set this first panel to be open by default. Now with um, tabs, that is already the default. So that's not really gonna do anything different. Uh, but with accordions, where they all begin with everything collapsed, if I set that first panel to be open, when it's created, it's going to be expanded for a student. And I could go ahead and choose some of those different styles. Um, if I go ahead and take a look at expanders, these are a little bit different because you can actually open multiple panels. So with the controls here, I can actually choose as many of these as I want to be open by default. Now, another thing that you probably noticed here is when you're working with tabs, these don't look like the saved tabs do. They're not aligned horizontally like they are, you know, when you're looking at the saved content. We are not building out accordions, expanders, and tabs in the rich content editor. That transformation happens when the live content is viewed. Uh, this is really just giving you a visual cue so that you can get that content built out. Um, the other thing that is a little bit different about expanders is you'll notice this expand slash collapse all controls. Uh, by default, though, that little toggle buttons uh, at the above of the expander will be created. 
it's okay if you don't agree with me that that's a better usability experience, but if you don't agree with me, you actually have to take the extra work to go turn it off. Um, so it is on by default uh, because I feel like that is a better experience. Okay, a uh, couple other things here. When it comes to working with these, this in your content, if you want to add something after it, you can't really put your cursor there if we put that there at the end of a content block. And no amount of hitting enter up here is going to take me out of this panel. So what you have over here in the sidebar is the ability to insert a paragraph after. If I go ahead and click that, I now have a blank paragraph after the content where I can start typing in whatever additional text I need to type. Okay, um, I'm going to trust you with a not so secret secret. You can place your cursor inside the panel for an existing accordion expander or tab, and you can use the at cursor to nest an accordion expander or tab. However, just because you can does not mean that you should. You can create a real usability nightmare for your students by creating weird convoluted combinations of accordions uh, and tabs that are all nested. Uh, this is something that I initially didn't make available, but I had enough people give me some well thought out use cases that I decided to trust you. Um, please don't make me or your students regret giving you that power. Um, so, so be conscientious if you use that nesting feature. The last thing that I want to point out is you need to pay attention to your heading structure. Now, these are all created by default with a level three heading um, that you can see there. But if you've nested this inside a content block or some existing content, that might not be the heading level you need. At some point, I want to give you a quick, easy way to change that until I can figure that out. What you can do is use the check accessibility tool that Michelle talked about in the first training. And we can come down here and we can say, all right, these actually should be level four headings and this Nesta guy should be a level five heading. So you can adjust those to where they need to be. Now, uh, these uh, panels work within the Canvas uh, on the desktop. They also work within the Canvas mobile app. And what they don't do, however, is they don't work if you were to do an EPUB export of your content or if you were to make the content available offline. If we choose the no style, this is part of why it's important uh, to make sure that you have that appropriate heading level. This is also why we don't transform the content in the rich content editor, because if that JavaScript isn't there, we want to make sure that this is still readable content and it just is created as a heading followed by content. Okay, any questions about accordions, expanders, or tabs? All right, if not, we'll go ahead and move on to the next one. So the next thing we're gonna take a look at are description lists. Okay, and that just made me realize one other thing I wanna point out about accordions, expanders, or tabs. You can put just about anything in those, um, but just be aware there have been a couple LTI tools that we've encountered. Um, because LTI tools often uh, in, embed content within an iframe, Sometimes those, depending on how they built their tool, they can freak out if they are loaded inside of uh, something that's hidden. So if they've got some weird thing going on to try and make things responsive, um, sometimes that may happen after their content loads. So if you find an LTI tool that doesn't work, you're welcome to send us a support ticket with kind of some, you know, the, the code that you were using. I've tried to do everything I can, so I'm not sure there's much more I can do, but I am happy to take a look. Um, but if you do have iframes inside of those, those will be the last things created so that it tries to give as much time as possible for that content to load so that it doesn't break it. So just be aware uh, of that when you're working with uh, iframed content inside of uh, those hidden things like uh, accordions, expanders, or tabs. All right, so description lists. Description lists are just another type of HTML list. Uh, you have kind of two different layout options you can choose from, but a, a, a description list is usually some sort of term followed by some sort of description or, you know, or definition. So this might be vocabulary, it might be a glossary, whatever the case may be. The two of display options, you have vertical where your term is bolded and then your description is underneath it slightly indented and then you have horizontal where they appear in columns next to each other. So let's go ahead and take a look at creating these. With this one, 
we're going to go ahead and scroll down and find in our rich content editor where we want to put this description list and go ahead and put our cursor there. Then we're going to come to the add advanced elements and open up the description list tool. And we're going to choose the add description list at cursor. This is going to put that first uh, term description pair in there. And you just use the rich content editor to go ahead and type in and update that however you need it to. To add additional items, there is an add item button that will keep adding term description pairs to the current list. So if I select this list up here and I choose add item, it'll just add it to that list. With the layout, the default is for these to be displayed vertically. If I want to change that to horizontal, I can go ahead and do that. But there are a few things to be aware of when it comes to horizontal lists. One of them is that these work well for short uh, terms, but if your term gets much longer, it gets concatenated with a dot, dot, dot. This is something coming from the Canvas style guide. Um, and so if you have longer terms, stick with the vertical description list where you can see the full term and the content. The other thing to be aware of is that when it comes to the mobile app, all description lists are displayed vertically. The mobile app is typically used on smartphones or smaller tablets where you are dealing with limited horizontal space. So we didn't even recreate that. It was one last bit of CSS that needed to be loaded into the rich or into the mobile app. And so in the mobile app, all description lists are vertical. Okay, any questions about description lists? Okay, if not, we'll go ahead and move on. The next thing we're gonna take a look at is what we call HTML snippets. Now, HTML snippets are really just pre-configured chunks of HTML that you can insert at the cursor position. Now, we've created a bunch of these for you, things like block quotes, additional heading levels, pre-formatted text and code blocks, a bunch of alerts. You know, we created some of these the hard way. This is a quick and easy way to throw one into your content. Um, they come in a variety of styles. There's some column layout options that you can choose from. There are some images with captions in a few different styles and layouts that you can choose from. And then at the institution level, you have the ability to define your own and we cover how to do that. Um, Katie, enjoy your other meeting uh, and you know the recording will be sent to you uh, after the fact. All right, um, but creating those HTML snippets will be something that's covered in the admin training. Okay, so let's go ahead and take a look here on how this works. I'm gonna come find where I wanna insert a snippet and I'm gonna go ahead and place my cursor there. Now the HTML snippets tool is one of two tools that when it's turned on, it always has a jump menu item for it. Um, so if I go ahead and click that, it's gonna take me down into the add advanced elements and to the HTML snippets tool. If you have institutional snippets, there's a drop down that'll allow you to select those or we can come choose from the design tools core snippets. Now, if you know what you're looking for, it's pretty easy to come in here and say, I want this, you know, uh, block alert success. And I can add that in the cursor position. And I now have this alert that I can start to go ahead and customize. However, when you're pretty new to design tools, you may not even know what you're looking for. And so there is this preview snippets. If I go ahead and select that, I get kind of a, I can see these, what they look like. And then I have the ability to click the button next to the one that I want and go ahead and insert it at the cursor position. So uh, I've done that. I have also just illustrated something that I do way too often, which is uh, find that my cursor is not where I thought my cursor was when I go ahead and insert that. Because of that, there is an undo redo option here. It is the same as the undo redo option up here, which is the same that you get when you do control Z on a PC or command Z on a Mac just allows you to kind of step back in time, place your cursor where you really want it to go, and then add in that snippet again, okay? I do wanna point out a couple things with uh, some of these other predefined um, snippets. One of them is when working with columns. Now you can choose from two columns or three columns down there. At the moment, these are pretty basic. So uh, two columns, each column's gonna take half the screen. Three columns, each column's gonna take a third of the screen. Uh, I am working on, uh, developing a column layout tool based off of kind of like the bootstrap columns that will give a lot more flexibility so that you can have one column be like a third of the width and the other column be two thirds uh, and some other fun things like that. Uh, it's just 
proving relatively complex to try and build out a UI for. Um, and when that happens, these will automatically update so that you can take advantage of the additional functionality as well. These are built to be responsive. If I change over to the app preview, and we scroll down, you can see that these will actually stack vertically as opposed to uh, displaying horizontally like they are here. Um, and so there are just you know, some options there with headings. The other one I wanna talk about is working with images with captions. So down at the bottom of the list, you have four styles, basic, Polaroid, and then a light and dark overlap option. And then each one has a left aligned, a center aligned, and a right aligned variation. So if you go ahead and select one of those, it's going to place that at the cursor position. Now this is right aligned, so I put my cursor at the first of this paragraph and it went ahead and moved it over there to the right. To change the, the default image that's there, now the default is just going to be the default um, because you know it's just a placeholder image. So to put in your own image, just go ahead and select that. You can use the embed image tool, you can use the upload embed image tool, pretty much any of the options that are available for you in Canvas to go ahead and select an image, you can go ahead and use that to go and replace that. Now, this is a, an image and a fig caption element inside a figure element. These are elements that are specifically designed to handle images and captions so that they make that association for screen readers. So I would just go ahead and I've replaced the image. I could use the rich content editor to go ahead and change my caption uh, to whatever I need that to be. Okay, um, now as I understand it, the fig caption is read by the screen reader as being connected to that image. I haven't found a hundred percent, you know, firm, this is a valid and it always works. Um, me personally, I'd probably err on the side of also setting alternative text, but it's kind of up to you and, and your, you know, institution's accessibility policies to determine which, you know, options you take there. The last thing I want to point out here with this uh, images and captions is that the width is not set on the image. So you can't just come into the images tool and change the width, it's not really gonna do anything. It's designed to fill that figure element. What you can do is if you want to open up the box styles tool, we could go ahead and change that, choose that figure, and then I could change that width to be like 200 pixels. And then that'll go ahead and resize that. Um, it's a little small for me, so maybe 250 pixels. So that's one easy way you can adjust that, is just going in here and changing that figure. Uh, the width using the, the box styles tool. Okay, any questions about HTML snippets? All right, if not, we'll go ahead and move on to icons. Now in the first training, Michelle talked about adding icons to content blocks and links and you know the navigation area and some places like that. Uh, you may come across a time, however, when you just want to add an icon somewhere. So let's say, for example, you've gone and you've created some sort of alert box, this little success box here, and we wanna add in an icon. I can go ahead and place my cursor here. The icons tool is the second tool that always has a jump menu up uh, here for it. So we can come down here. Now you'll notice that all of the existing icons have a button built there for them. And if I go ahead, I can also choose to insert the icon at the cursor position. So I'm gonna go ahead and choose that. And let's say we want to search for a check mark, and then we found the one we want, we go ahead and add it. Now, the other thing that comes into play is let's say, no, I want to have this rounded one, or maybe I want this square one. Because we are still inserting an icon at the cursor position, we now have three icons. So that's not what we want to do. Um, you'll also notice over here in the icons tool, those didn't automatically show up. What we can do is we can refresh the icon list here and now we can see those. So if you want to change an icon, find its button here among the existing icons and go ahead and click it. And now we are looking at replacing that icon. And so I could come in here and search, you know, open up my arrows category and I could choose from some different options. And this is going to update that rather than uh, adding a new one. You could also do that if you wanted to remove an icon from the content. Choosing that remove icon is going to go ahead and clear that out. Sometimes if you try and delete in the rich content editor, sometimes deleting works. Sometimes, and I'm not sure why the reasoning is, sometimes it kind of skips over it like it's not even there. So, 
you know, that is one way to, to go ahead and quickly uh, remove that. All right, uh, styling. If you want to, to work with the styling of one of these, let's say we want to go ahead and change the color. So I'm going to open up my colors tool here. And let's say I want this little tree to be green. Now, you should be able to, for the most part, put your cursor there and find where you've got the apply to as that eye tag. There are a couple times where I've had where I just can't quite select it. Uh, an update Canvas made to the Rich Content Editor not too long ago made this much easier. But, and you know, what you can do if you can't quite seem to select it is if you open up the icons tool and you hover over the button, um, it's going to bring that into focus. Probably you'll come up with a better way at some point in the, the future to do this, but uh, like I said, it's become a lot easier to actually select that. But then I could go ahead and come in here and let's say I want to change the text color for this Christmas tree to be a lovely green color, and we can go ahead and set that. But you can use that, you know, depending on what you're wanting to do, we could go through here and just kind of have some fun with our icons, the, the new color picker, this is another thing that I like about it because you can quickly go through and set that without having to keep opening up the color. All right, um, the last thing when it comes to icons is in regards to accessibility. Now, by default, if you were using design tools to insert an icon, it is purely decorative in nature because you don't need to know there's a stethoscope here to know that this block is going to talk about icons and accessibility. And you don't need to know that this HTML snippet has a check mark or, you know, uh, whatever, because there is an alternative in the text. If you wanted to use an icon as the sole means of relaying content, say you wanted to use like a Facebook or LinkedIn icon to link out to, to a, a particular Facebook page or LinkedIn page, you would need to make additional steps to make sure that had an accessible alternative for a screen reader. Uh, because the current icons are actually hidden from screen readers. Font Awesome, where we pull in most of our icons, has some great resources on how to do that accessibly. And at some point in the future, I will probably be building that into the tools. Uh, it's just a matter of, of getting some time to do that. But until that time, you are responsible for making sure that there is an accessible alternative if there isn't an alternative just already in the content. Okay? Any questions about icons? All right, then we will go ahead and move on. The next thing we're gonna take a look at is a module list. Now I'm gonna show you some of the different things we can set with this and then we'll actually talk about how to add this to the content. But the module list is really just a quick and easy way to add links to your different modules to a given page. Works really well on a front page, but it can be used anywhere. Um, now, having links is great, but as a student, I always get lost. I, you know, once we got beyond module two or three, I could never remember what module I was supposed to be on. And so one of the other things we can do with design tools is we can identify the current module and we can either set that manually, or you can set up a series of date ranges that will dynamically identify for a student what the current module is on. And this works both for the desktop version and for the mobile app version of Canvas. Now where these point, by default, if I were to, on the, the desktop, if I were to click this, it's going to take me to the modules page and bring that module into focus. On the mobile app, um, if you were to click on that, it's going to open up that uh, default mobile app view where you can see the list of items. With the desktop, there are also a couple of additional fun things that we can do. Um, one of them is we can start to include what we call quick links. Now, if I choose to include quick links for the current module, What's going to happen is once it's identified what the current module is, it is going to build out below that what a student would see on the modules page for that module. So that includes links to all the items, point values, due dates, completion requirements, prerequisites, lock status, if it's late or not, whether it has been turned in or not, all of that type of information they're going to see um, on their front page. Right now we're showing it for the current module, which means we're on level two. If I'm using a date range and next week rolls around and we're on level three, that list is going to change and show that content for level three. Um, if we want to go uh, even further and give even more information, we can choose to turn on quick links for all the modules, which is going to dynamically transform that list of links into a series of tabs. So we can see we're currently on level two, but I can look back and see what I may have missed in level one or what's coming up in level three. 
Um, you'll also notice that um, the buttons here are not the full name of the module. What's going to happen is it's going to look for a colon. This is something that's added if you use like the module builder to build out your content. And it will split it on that and just grab whatever's before that so that your buttons don't get really huge. Uh, and it's also going to just kind of try and display those and it'll wrap as needed uh, to give you access to those buttons. Okay, so that's some of the different settings. Let's go ahead and talk about how you add these. So I'm going to go ahead and edit this page. And we are going to um, go ahead and come in the design tool sidebar to our add advanced elements and our module list tool. If I go ahead and turn this on, any module that is currently published will automatically be added to the list. If you want to turn on or off a given link, just go ahead and click the little icon next to it, uh, and that'll toggle its visibility there in the list. Speaking of icons, uh, there is kind of a default icon there, but we can go ahead and open up the module list icon, and we could, let's say we want to use kind of a chess theme, we could come in here and we could make uh, each of our module icons into a pawn. Uh, or there's a button next to each of these links that we could come in and we could customize uh, those icons if we wanted to use a specific icon uh, to go along with each individual module, okay? All right, a couple other options here. Columns. When you are either using just the, the plain list or even if you are, you know, have marked a current item or you are doing quick links for the current, you can adjust the columns uh, that that list is broken up into. So by default on the browser, it is set for two columns. And then as the size decreases, it'll drop down to one column. If you have really long modules names, maybe you want it to always be one column. Or if you have shorter ones, maybe you want it to be three columns or four columns. Now, I do know how to count just because, you know, when we select four, it's showing three. And when we select three, we're showing two. That's because of the responsive nature of this. It would be four columns on the largest desktop size, and then it's going to drop down as the size decreases or three columns and then drop down. All right. Browser only features. I talked about how the default is for these links to point to the modules page and bring that module into focus. The other thing we can do is we can tell that that we want that to point to the first item within each module. And what that's going to do is instead of going to the modules page, it'll take whatever that first item is in the module and it's going to direct you to that. Now, Canvas does have this tendency if you copy a course over from one semester to another or you import this from a, some master shell, as Canvas is updating the IDs for the modules, it's going to break the link and turn it back into the modules page. If you edit this, design tools will try and go through and reset that if you had it set to that first item, but just something to be aware of that you need to come in and edit if you want to use that first item option. The other option is that quick links. Now we can set quick links for current, we can select quick links for all, or we can you know, take that away and go back to where it's just a basic set of links. Now setting quick links for current right now would do absolutely nothing because we haven't told it what the current module is. To do that manually, we can come check the box next to whatever the current module is. I know from having taught a course, I'd forget to do that beyond about module two or three. So the other option we have is we can open up the show dates field. We can say, all right, this is going to run from Monday through Sunday. Uh, and then it will duplicate that pattern, but I can make any adjustments that I need to. And when a student comes to the page, it's going to take a look at that date range. It's going to take a look at today's date, and it's going to dynamically identify for them what the current module is. When you're in the blocks view, you can actually see those date ranges. They are actually encoded into the link, um, but it's not something that's visible to students or to screen readers when the content has been saved. The other thing to be aware of with these dates, um, because Canvas doesn't have anything built in by default to say that a module should be looked at from this point to this point, you can lock it down and only make it available from a specific period of time. But this is another piece that's not going to dynamically update if you move your module uh, from one semester to another. And so the easiest way is to just click this clear and then go set those dates again. The last thing that I want to talk about is with this module list is that this is a snapshot of your modules as they existed when um, you added this list. This is because you know when it comes to the mobile app, I don't have a way to even consider dynamically updating that list. 
And so if you want to change the, if you've gone to the modules page and you've renamed a bunch of things or rearranged things, what you can do is you can use this reset list, which will actually clear it out and then put it back in. Um, it will try and keep track of icons. It'll try and keep track of date ranges. It is not going to keep track of whether you had it turned on or, or off because there's not really a way to know if it was turned off or if it's just a new module item. And so it's just going to automatically turn it back on. So you may need to come, you know, adjust visibility. The other drawback is if you've done a bunch of manual overriding of styling or layout, um, this is going to overwrite that. I have some plans. I, you know, when I can get some time, I'll try and update that. So it really is just focusing on the, the text and the order. Um, the other thing it's going to do is because it's removing it and adding it back in, it would add, end up at the bottom of the page. So if you wanted it somewhere else, you'd need to you know, do the add rearrange blocks and move it back up where it was. Okay. All right. Any questions about the module list? Okay, let's move on. Okay, the next thing that we are going to take a look at is working with progress indicators. Now we have three different types that you can choose from. There's a basic progress bar, which is going to go ahead and grab the current module name. It's also going to identify how many items are in the current module and where the current item falls in that range, and then build out a progress bar for you so that you can see that. This next option, is going to um, give you kind of that same visual idea of how far chronologically you are uh, through the, the module. Um, but it also creates a link to all of the different items. So if I wanted to go directly to this assignment or this discussion or this quiz, I could go ahead and click on that and it's going to take me there. Uh, the last option here is very similar to what we were talking about with quick links except for it's going to build that out for just the current module. And then it's also going to uh, give a little indicator of where the current item is in that module. Um, okay, so those are the different options. These are all currently based off of your linear progress through a module. It's not based off of uh, completion requirements or anything like that. It's just showing it that way. Uh, at some point in the future, I will be developing some uh, progress bars to show you progress through an entire course or also progress bars that are based more off of completion rather than you know your actual you know moving from one item to another uh, but I've got to come up with the designs before I can build those out all right so let's take a look at creating these like most things uh, to go ahead and add this you're going to come into your rich content editor we're going to choose where we want to add that progress bar, come to our add advanced elements, open up the module progress navigation, and we're going to choose whether we want it to be a basic progress bar or the icon or the details. And it's just gonna put a placeholder in here because the actual progress bars are dynamically built when the content is viewed. Uh, this allows you to add these into like your templates as you're working with the module builder. And then as it populates that out into all of the different modules, it's going to automatically show that. It also will make it so that if you rearrange the content in your modules, they are going to automatically reflect that uh, rearranging as well. So it'll always show what the current module is. If I want to remove or change the, the progress bar type, I can come in here and either remove it or I can replace it with the icon option. The one other piece that you can customize with these is that background color. Okay, so the default is this blue, but if I open up my colors tool, I can go ahead and maybe I want it to be green instead. And you can go ahead and set that. And now when the progress bar gets built out for the user, the color is going to be that green color rather than the default blue. Okay, any questions on adding in progress bars? If not, there are a couple other things I wanna point out about these. As I cancel editing this page, or if I were to save editing this page, what's going to happen is instead of seeing a progress bar, you are going to see this little message saying, I don't know what module item we're in. Um, in order for these to work, they rely on this module item ID that Canvas adds to the URL as you're navigating a module. So that includes using the next and previous, it includes if you've gone to the modules page and clicked on an item, or if you've used any of the quick link options within design tools uh, or the you know, icon navigation, things like that. 
but when those aren't there, we can't retrieve the API to know what module we're in. And so for a teacher, they'll see the notice. For students, it's just not going to show. It's just going to strip out that placeholder. Uh, once that does exist, then you can see it's going to build those out for you. All right. I think that covers everything with the, the progress bars. Any additional questions? Okay. Let's go ahead and take a look at objectives and outcomes. Now, eventually, I really am wanting to build these to where they dynamically pull from the course level or the account level in Canvas. If you are using those right now, you'll be aware that is a painful experience. Right now, what this tool is, it's found in the advanced, add advanced elements and objectives and outcomes. And this is really just a clipboard for some standardized objective text. So for example, core to design tools is the ability to use Bloom's revised taxonomy. This is just a series of terms to help you write out objectives. Now we can always add it in the cursor position, or if I want to expand a list, I can choose to you know, add to the current list. But maybe I'm gonna have my students match something, maybe they are going to evaluate something, maybe they are going to design something. Just some terms to help them write those out. Then at the institution level, you have the ability to define other groupings of objectives. So for example, here at Utah State, we use idea objectives. So maybe I wanna let my students know that this particular item is going to deal with objective three and objective eight and objective 11. And it's just adding in that, that text into the rich content editor to add some transparency to students. It's not building out rubrics, it's not trackable anyway. It's really just trying to save you having to go out to a standard website copy the content and come paste it in here and clean up all the other stuff that often comes with that process. Okay. Any questions about objectives and outcomes? All right, go ahead and move on. The next thing we're going to talk about is adding in information about teachers and TAs that are enrolled in the current course. So this is also in the add advanced elements section and we have the ability to come down and choose teacher and TA details. Now, every user that is enrolled as a teacher or TA will automatically get a control here. I can go ahead and open that up. It will grab their avatar images that's set in Canvas, their name, their email address. There's some other pieces here that you can put in. And then I can either add this at the cursor position or I can add it as a content block. And it's really just gonna give me some very basic information uh, about that user. You can, um, maybe if I wanna be called instructor instead of teacher, I can go ahead and do that and I could update the details or I could just come over here and you know adjust the content here. You have, can adjust other things in here if you want. Let's say I wanna come in here and choose a different border style or I wanna come into my icons tool and choose you know a new icon. You can go ahead and do that. Now, one of the things that you do need to be aware of, this is a fairly basic tool at the moment. If you were to change your avatar image in Canvas, this is not going to automatically update because every avatar gets its own unique URL. So if I were to come in here, I do have the ability to update the details to replace that avatar image. The problem is the way that this is currently set up, if you update that, those details, it resets everything back to the default. So it's changed that border, it's changed the icon back, uh, if you had overwritten any other styling or manually typed any other information in there, it's going to override it. So um, I do have some future plans for some additional layouts and some more flexibility when it comes to these. Right now, this is intended as just kind of a quick and easy way to add in that content. Any questions about teacher TA details? If not, we'll go ahead and uh, move on to the last one we're going to talk about here in this intermediate level. Although this tool is not um, part of any of the default comfort levels because it is fairly subject specific, this is the ability to um, access language accent characters. Now, um, what we can do is we're gonna come to the settings here. I'm gonna scroll to the very bottom of the list where we turned on the betas tool for the colors. And you can see here is the language accents tool. I can manually turn that on. And now I've got this button down below my sidebar. If I go ahead and select that, I can choose from French, German, Italian, Latin, Portuguese, or Spanish. 
And if I select one of those, I can see all of the accent characters that are used by that particular language. And so what we can do is uh, we can highlight in the rich content editor and replace. Uh, this also works in like the naming field if we wanted to do that. As you hover over, you will see an enlarged version um, of that character as well as the Windows and Mac keyboard shortcuts to allow you to type that character. Um, and that can just be used as, you know, if you need as you're typing along, you can go ahead and choose that uh, and make those adjustments as well. So that is how it works for an instructor or someone working on just kind of a content page. When it comes to the types of items in Canvas that take student responses, there are some other things that we can do. So for example, if we take a look at a quiz and I go ahead and edit this quiz, if we open up that language accents tool, you will notice an additional setting there. And that is the ability to let students use this for responses. If that's turned on, you'll show, see a little label up here in the top. Um, and this, the language accents tool will become available for students taking that quiz. Now this does have to be turned on for any element that you or any piece of content in Canvas where you want them to be able to use this language accents tool. There's not a way for me to set a course level setting that says for every piece of student content in this course, I want to be them to be able to see the language accent characters tool. There's just not really a way to do that inside of Canvas um, or through the information I have about the course in the JavaScript. So um, once we've got that turned on, if we were to go ahead and, and, and leave the editing mode and come take a look at this quiz, what happens is now over here on the side, we have the language accents tool. If I go ahead and click that, now as I am replying to questions or as I am typing up, you know, responses in a, a description area or a text area, you can utilize those different characters. Same thing when it comes to discussions, whether it is for students or teachers, if we go ahead and open that up, we can now come in and, you know, we can utilize that language accents character in, in that uh, response. Okay, any questions about the language accent characters? I will let you know if you do happen to have need of additional languages, other French, German, Italian, Latin, Portuguese, or Spanish, the Latin-based languages I was able to figure out on my own to know what was needed. Um, however, when it comes to other languages like, you know, Russian or, you know, Chinese, any of those, I have no idea what it looks like to work with HTML in that language. So if you have someone that is a subject matter expert that you want to put in contact with me, I am happy to add additional options to this tool. Um, I just need to know what it is I actually need to add. Okay, good on that one. Okay, so we have now survived level two. We've talked about working with styling. We've talked about some advanced elements. We're gonna finish up here in these, these last, hopefully I can get this done in these last 15 minutes, uh, talking about level three. We're gonna introduce a couple new advanced elements and then we're gonna introduce some helper tools for those who spend a lot of time working with HTML and having to clean up things and, and stuff like that. So uh, first of all here, we're gonna talk about um, pop-up content. So this includes tool tips, popovers, uh, popovers can either be just informational, which means when your mouse moves off of that or your keyboard focus move off, moves off of that trigger, it disappears. Or they can be interactive, which allows you to click on links in that or tab through the content of that. And then we also have modal dialogues. These all have some similarities and then they all have some pieces that are unique to them. So we're gonna go ahead and edit this page. We're going to come into our design tool settings and now we're gonna turn on the advanced level. So this is gonna add a few advanced elements, add a few customized the style pieces. It's also added a new tool down here that we'll talk about in just a moment. And I'm gonna go ahead and turn off that language accents tool. Okay, so let's go ahead and take a look at creating um, this pop-up content. If we come to our add advanced elements section and the pop-up content tool, you can see we have a control to create a tool tip, a popover, or a modal. You'll also see there are some examples if you can't remember which one's which that allow you to come in and see uh, the difference between a tooltip, a popover, or a modal. With all of these to create them, you're going to highlight in the rich content editor what you want to trigger uh, that particular 
items. So if I go ahead and click that trigger and I click tooltip, it's going to turn that selected text into a link and add a little span after it that's going to house that text. If I click a trigger and choose a popover, it turns that link into uh, that or that text into a link and it's going to add a div where we can start to put over the con in the content for that popover. If we choose to add a modal, it's going, oh, sorry, I clicked the example and not the add. If we choose that, it's going to turn it into a link and add a div where we can put that content in. Now you'll notice with modals, it has this additional modal title because when you click this, there is this little title area that's populated in there uh, so that you can go ahead and see that. Okay, um, let's talk about some uh, other things here. When you select either a trigger or its content, over in the sidebar, you can adjust the text of that. The rich content editor gets a little weird. Sometimes it clears those out. So if I go ahead and you know update this, it'll go ahead and change that. With tooltips, you also have the ability to update the tooltip text uh, by typing that in there just because of kind of that similar issue. With popovers, you can go ahead and change that trigger text and then you have the option to make it interactive. So by default, it's just informational. If you turn on the interactive, you'll see the little label there is changed. And now you can actually hover over and interact with the contents in that tooltip. And with modal dialogues, you can change the trigger text and then you can change the width of that modal dialogue. I recommend using pixels. You can also use percentages. Just know that that can vary greatly depending on the size of your screen. The last thing that I wanna point out with these uh, is that both modals and popovers are a trigger followed by a div. And it's gonna try and put that div as close as it can. We added this inside a list, so it added it after the list. It added this one in and it added it after that paragraph. But because they are very similar, we can actually change our modal dialogue to a popover. If we do that, it'll update the labels. Um, you'll notice that the modal title was left behind. If you wanna get rid of that, you can. If we were to take a popover and change it to a modal, it is going to make sure that it has that modal title, okay? Oh, I guess the other thing that, that we can take a look at, there is a highlight option, which will help you make sure you know what's connected to what. Um, and then the delete option, is actually going to delete both the trigger text and the content. Um, so, and that's the same with all of them. Okay, any questions about tooltips, modals, or popovers? I'm gonna undo that here for a second. Um, these work just fine on the desktop or the browser version of Canvas. They work just fine on the mobile app. Um, on the mobile app, modal dialogues are a little bit different. They are just a variation of a popover. Uh, that used the space and the user experience was better on the mobile app than trying to create the, the modal dialogues. Uh, it was inconsistent between the student app and the teacher app and there were some other issues with it there. Uh, and so it uses kind of that same popover um, scripting. Uh, the other thing is when it comes to like EPUB exports, you've just got your inline visibility. This is about what you're gonna see. You're gonna see a link with the text after it. You're gonna see a link with the div after it. If you click on that link, it would bring that into focus. And that's about all we can do there for those different options. Okay, good on that one. And let's go ahead and move on to the next one here. Uh, the next uh, advanced element that we're going to take up, this is another one, just so you know, uh, your content that's inside of this, if you're using like uh, videos or external LTI tools, this may or may not cooperate because of it being hidden when that content's trying to load. Um, it will try and delay it, but you know, if it doesn't work, you may just have to find a different option on how to use that. Okay, the last one, uh, the, or sorry, the next one, not the last one, we're gonna take a look at is quick checks. Now these are just ungraded, untracked, multiple choice questions that you can insert in the content to give instant feedback to students. It's just a quick formative assessment. So if I say, is this question graded? and you say yes, I can say, no, sorry, you were not listening. This is not graded. Maybe you need to reread this paragraph. Maybe you should consult this portion of the textbook, watch this little video, whatever the case may be. Uh, if you get it right, you can say, yay, good job. Thank you for listening, whatever the case may be. These can, uh, the responses can include images, 
They can include video playlists, just about anything should be able to work in there. It's an HTML div. Uh, once again, it is hidden initially, so you might run into some issues with some external LTI tools, uh, but in general, the majority of things will work in there. These can be added as their own content block, or they can be added at the cursor position, which would allow you to nest them into like an accordion or something like that. Now, these are not tracked or graded primarily because I have no desire to go ever anywhere near the realm of FERPA data. But what you can do is hide the next link until they've answered all the quick checks. Now they can circumnavigate that any number of ways. But what happens is once I get this last question correct, now I can see that next button and I can move on. Okay, so let's just kind of quickly cover how you actually create these. It's very similar to a lot of the other things that we've already talked about. We're going to come to our add advanced elements section and we are going to choose quick checks and I can add it as a content block or at the cursor position and it's just going to lay out that basic structure for you. You can use your uh, cursor or in your keyboard, the rich content editor to go ahead and type in your question, your answers, your responses. Over here in the design tools sidebar, you can add additional answers if you want. If you want to have not just maybe a true or false, but you know, a lot of different options. It's always a good idea to actually mark one of them correct, and you would do that using the little checkbox next to it. If you need to delete things, you can. You can also drag and drop and rearrange if you want to change the order around. Um, and that's really the basics of what, what, how that works. Now, this is in the advanced elements section, in part because you are doing so much in the rich content editor to customize this, and it really is easy to break if you're not paying careful attention as you're highlighting and deleting and you know pasting and stuff like that. Um, this is also something that works on the browser version and the mobile app version of Canvas, but when it comes to like an EPUB export or an um, offline content, you really just see everything spit out there on the page. There's no CSS or JavaScript to stylize it. So it's really just kind of left up to how well you wrote your answers and responses of whether that actually, you know, how well it works in those instances. Okay, any questions about quick checks? I guess the other thing I didn't talk about is that hide next link um, until completed feature. This is an all or nothing setting. If this is on, they have to answer all of the quick checks. If it's off, they don't have to answer any. There's not really a way to kind of pick and choose and say, I want this one to be required and I want this one to be optional. The other thing that, that I guess I should point out, and I, I failed to do this with the tooltips and popovers, but it also applies to quick checks. When you um, choose the browser view, those responses are hidden because it needs to give you more of an idea of what this is going to look like when saved. And so same with the tooltips and popovers, you'd see the triggers, but not the actual responses. Um, so you need to be in that blocks view to actually see and work with that content. Okay, good on that one. All right, let's go ahead and take a look at the next ones here. Um, this last one, this last advanced element uh, is the ability to add CSS and JavaScript to the course level. Basically, it allows you to create a folder called CSS and a file called style.css um, inside the current course and make that available. Sounds super exciting, but it definitely has some drawbacks. One of them is that um, the content has to load before it knows to go retrieve that style sheet. So for example, this CSS is adjusting the colors of this stylized heading. So if I reload this page, you'll notice it loads without those colors and then it applies the colors. So, you know, there is that lag that would kind of drive me crazy. Um, the other drawback is this is not something that currently works in the mobile app. I have yet to be able to convince the mobile app that it wants to allow it to go grab that file and, and allow access to it. Um, so this is kind of a last resort feature for the desktop. Um, and, you know, it's really just a toggle switch here within design tools. If we come to the advanced elements um, and we come to the custom CSS, if it's turned on, there's a little label here. You can see the CSS in the editor. If we turn it off, that label goes away, as does the CSS. Just kind of a last resort feature that sometimes it's the only way you may be able to achieve uh, something that you're hoping for. Okay, any questions about that one? Okay, we've got four minutes and I've got three tools left. So we might be a few minutes over, um, but this is being recorded. So if you do have to step away, uh, you can catch the last little bit here uh, when, you, when you get the recording of it. Okay, 
One of my favorites that we gain in this uh, advanced level is the advanced HTML editor. Now I'm very grateful that Canvas gives you an HTML editor and it seems inevitable that at some point or other, you're gonna have to come in here and do something. Uh, whether you're wanting to create something new or whether you're helping someone troubleshoot something that they may have broken, the, you, I've, you find yourself in here. And it doesn't really matter how competent you are in HTML, even if you're a little insane like me and enjoy working with HTML, this is a painful process. And so the advanced HTML editor really just gives you this little pop-up that you can use. And if I want to use uh, edit an image, I can select an image and I can go ahead and just work with the HTML for that image. If I wanna work my way up, I can look at the paragraph that's in, I can work at the, look at the divs that's in. I can go all the way up to where I'm looking at the whole body of the content. Um, it's nesting the tags for you, which is one of the things that kills me the most, trying to use the Canvas one. It's also offering some syntax highlighting uh, so that you can kind of see those different attributes and tags and stuff. And then if you are crazy like me and enjoy uh, working with HTML, there are some other really fun things in here, uh, like multiple cursor positions and find and replace and duplicating lines of code, a bunch of other fun stuff. You can actually open up this keyboard shortcuts if you want to learn about all the different things that you can do with this great open source editor. A um, couple other things here. Um, by default, word wrap is turned on so that you're just scrolling vertically to see your content. Sometimes, depending on what you're troubleshooting, it's nicer to have that turned off so that you can see things you know, that are similar lined up. So you can go ahead and turn that on or off. You can also resize this. Now, width-wise, the editor does pretty good uh, at resizing. If you want it to grow height-wise, uh, this max lines, just go ahead and adjust that and that'll allow that to um, increase and be taller. The last thing that I want to point out in here is when you're working with an element that is not the body, you have the ability to unwrap that element or to delete that element. Unwrapping will get rid of the start and end tags, but leave the content behind. Deleting will get rid of the content or, or the, the element and all of its content. So if I unwrap this bolded note, you'll notice the note stays behind. It's just no longer bold. If I come in here and I want to select this uh, group of, of images here and I want to delete it, it's going to get rid of all of that and clear out all of that content. I know sometimes for me when I'm trying to delete things, some scraps get left behind and it just gets kind of problematic. All right, any questions about the advanced HTML editor? Okay, two tools left to go. Um, so I built the advanced HTML editor because I got tired of using the HTML editor in Canvas. These last two tools I built because there were things that I got tired of having to open HTML up for, uh, period. One of them is working with HTML attributes. Now, each element type has some different attributes. I've tried to go through Canvas's whitelist to look at what elements it allows and what attributes can be set on that. Um, if you're not familiar with HTML attributes, don't panic too much. Um, I'll show you a couple use cases and, you know, if none of the rest of it applies, then you don't need to worry about this tool. For example, with a link, its attributes are like its ref, which is um, actually lets you know where that link is going to point, or its target, which lets you know uh, if it's going to open in a new tab or not. And there are just a bunch of different element or attributes for different element types. Let me show you just a few things uh, that you may find uh, useful when working in Canvas. One of them, th these are the last two tools are both in the current element style, but I'm gonna go ahead and open up the HTML attributes. In fact, I like to pop these out, so I'm gonna go ahead and do that. Each element, you can adjust its ID, its class, and its style. So I wanna spec specifically look at each of these elements. The ID, now when you're working with JavaScript and CSS, this is something you can use. But this is also something that if you have ever wanted to have a link in your content, point somewhere else in your content, you can use an ID for this. So let's say we want this example link to point to this, why would I use this heading? If I come into this heading, I can give this an ID. Let's say I want to call this my destination. Now, uh, it has to have at least one character, don't put spaces in it. If you're gonna use capitals, just be consistent in all the places you reference it, that you use those capitals. Um, avoid starting with a number, things like that. Um, but we can go ahead and give that uh, an ID. 
And then I can come down to this existing link. You would actually have to create it using, you know, like the link tools in Canvas pointing somewhere. But then instead of this pointing to a website, I'm gonna go ahead and hit a pound symbol to say that I want this to point to an ID and I'm going to give it that ID of my destination. Now, if I were to save that, clicking on that example link would bring so that that why would I use that heading is in focus. That's just one uh, example of where you might use this tool. Now, another thing that you may run into is using CSS classes. Now, within design tools, we use CSS classes for a lot of the different styling things. So you could go ahead and see what's in there. You could add additional classes if you've customized some at the institution level. Um, for example, uh, there is a lead class that I use in some of the, the content I create. Uh, it's also kind of part of, it's kind of built into the, to Canvas as well. Uh, but you can apply it to a paragraph to make that paragraph slightly larger in text uh, in size and, you know, and layout. Uh, there is also a capitalize class that I use in different things. And that will actually make sure that the first letter of each word is capitalized. But you have kind of that ability to set those up. Then the other one that can come in handy is working with inline styles. So I'm gonna give this a well class just so that it uh, sticks out a little bit better there. And then I can use this to actually write out CSS without having to go into the HTML. So maybe I want this to have a width of 400 pixels. I can also put each of these declarations on their own line, uh, whereas writing HTML, it's all inline. Uh, and then maybe I want this to have a margin of auto so that that is centered. And so you have that ability to set that. You can also come in and review what is set on something. So when you've used design tools to set colors or spacing or borders, a lot of these are using classes and inline style to set them. So if you wanted to come in and change this uh, to be Aggie Blue, I could go ahead and change that. Then I would need to change that text to white. But just some other things that you can do. You could also come in here and copy all of this and I could choose another paragraph and paste that. Um, although with the new box styles tool, I would recommend just saving that so that you can apply it later uh, to just about anything, okay? All right, and then there are other attributes uh, that just vary based on elements. Uh, for example, you can come in here to like an ordered list and there are a bunch of different numbering types. The default ones are over here, but say you need a Hebrew list, you know, we can go ahead and set that. And there's just a bunch of different options in there that you can uh, use and work with. Uh, if you're working with tables, maybe you want to use the column span. Um, that will actually bump these out, so you have to do some cleanup, but it does give you one way and a way to access that. And just some other things to be aware of. Any questions about that one? Okay, last tool. This last tool is what um, I lovingly refer to as the junk drawer of design tools. It's really just a place I've put everything else that I've uh, had need of or you know, wanted to use or found myself doing commonly um, that I didn't have a better place for inside of the tools. So once again, this is in the current element style. So we can use the little target up here in the jump menu to go right down to find this tool. And it's this additional actions tool. And really, there's just a bunch of buttons here. Some of these will be familiar. For example, when we talked about like accordions, if you have content and you want to get something after it and you just can't quite get your cursor where you need to, there's the ability to add a paragraph. Oh, I'm looking at the paragraph, so that didn't work quite as well. I can select that div and I can add a paragraph above it or a paragraph below it so that I can come in here and start adding additional content. Removing empty elements. Now, uh, this remove empty up here clears out all of the empty elements within a page. If you have one that you want to remain and you're just trying to clean something else, something up, we could come in here and we could choose this div. And if I remove the empty, it's just going to clear that out and leave any other empty elements untouched. Um, wrapping a selection in a div. We have the ability to create a block alert, but sometimes I've needed a div to create something custom. And so I found myself creating a block alert and then going and clearing out the classes from it. So I added in here the ability to just highlight and just wrap the selection in a div. You just have a generic div that you can now do whatever you need to with it. You would still need to do the remove empty to get rid of any orphan pieces that were left behind on that one as well. Unwrap and delete. These are the same things we talked about in the advanced HTML editor. Um, just is gonna clear out the tag or delete the content. Just another place that I 
uh, found I can have this open and it doesn't take up quite as much screen real estate as the other. Um, clearing, cleaning up stuff. Okay, so Canvas does have this clear formatting where you can highlight a bunch of stuff and clear it out. Um, the problem is it gets rid of everything. Uh, and that can include things that are bolded or italicized, which normally when I'm trying to clean up messy code that I've copied and pasted from somewhere, that's not one of the things that I want to get rid of. And so we do have a little more control over what we can clean up using uh, this tool. So if I go ahead and highlight this try it div, um, I can clear out any inline styles. So if we look at that content, that's cleared out the borders and the font style and anything that was written using that style attribute on an element. Um, if I want to get rid of CSS classes, I can choose to get rid of CSS classes. If I wanted to clear out any IDs in there, I could do that as well. Um, if I wanted to unwrap any divs that might be in that content, I've, I've copied and pasted from websites before where everything was nested in divs. And we can go ahead and choose that unwrap divs and it will get rid of any divs that are in there. Uh, there's also the ability to unwrap spans. Spans are one in particular that drives me crazy because you may copy and paste things. Sometimes even if you're just copying and pasting from one place in the rich content editor to another place, it wraps everything in spans. And so, um, we can go ahead and come in here, and if I choose this block quote, I can unwrap all of the spans in there. So that's gonna go through and clean up that code. Another thing that you run into is these non-breaking spaces. So a non-breaking space is designed to keep two words together um, so that it doesn't line break on that space, hence the non-breaking space. But sometimes when you copy and paste, you get a lot of these. And if a lot of those exist, it can throw off the way that your content can be responsive. Or if there's a non-breaking space between every word, which I've had things that I've copied and pasted in and added that, it will actually force the words to break in the middle of a word, which you don't want. So we can go ahead and choose that and we can choose change non-breaking spaces to normal spaces. And it will go ahead and clean those up. And now you can see this fits a lot better into that space. Okay, last one here, one of my favorites is the ability to rearrange contents. So if I were to select a li this list here, and, and not just the item, but the whole list, I can open up this rearrange contents tool. And this is gonna create a control for each of the items in this list. And I can drag and drop and rearrange these items. Uh, if I'm looking at a table, I can come to the body of a table and I can drag and drop to rearrange the columns of that table. If I am looking at a particular row, of a table, I can come in here and I can drag and drop to change the order of that row. Now you can also go uh, up levels. So let's say I wanna look at this whole div. I can now say I want the table to be up above um, that list. Or you know maybe uh, I'm just wanting to clean up some stuff and I can come in here and hit the delete and just clean that up without leaving stuff, you know, pieces behind, okay? All right, so hopefully if none of the others are interesting to you, that one is one that I find particularly helpful. Any questions about the additional actions tool? Okay, that being said, you have now survived uh, your functional user training, both part one, part two, you've been introduced to all of the current tools uh, and how they work, and now it's just up to you uh, to go figure out what kind of fun things you want to create. Any last questions? Okay. If not, you all have a wonderful day. And let us know. You can reach out to us through our support uh, portal or you know, support at citylabs.com like Michelle talked about in the first training and just let us know how we can be of help. Bye.